Senko is proud to partner with the Oz IMM in this webinar series on ESG. And the series is looking at how ESG factors are and can be embedded in our work and what the future looks like. Um, this webinar series continues on from our involvement in a recent panel discussion in August with our regional president, Aresh Dionarain. Uh, this first webinar is looking at embedding ESG and mining projects all the way from concept to operation. Um, then in the months of October and November, we'll have follow-up webinars. Webinar number two will cover cutting edge technologies, enabling sustainability. And the third webinar in the series, the future of the mining industry in ESG. I encourage you all to register for these webinars. It's going to be a, a great uh, series and some fantastic discussion will happen in the ESG space. The key topics for today, I'll be starting off talking about ESG considerations in studies. I'll then hand over to John Coop, who will be discussing design for sustainability. And finally, Daniel Wilford will be discussing social factors in project delivery. So ESG drivers for studies. The first and most important part for setting the right time for ESG is responsible planning. Early alignment and identification of drivers is critical. And the most important part of this is actively listening to our stakeholders. Key areas to identify include environmental impact, uh, social and community considerations particular to the site, Indigenous engagement. There can be factors relating to funding sources. Uh, access to certain funding sources um, may require a particular ESG focus. Uh, as a baseline and a minimum standard, we need to have a thorough understanding of our legislative and licensing requirements, but the industry is now moving towards uh, layering ESG best practice and principles on top. Uh, this layered approach then sets the pathway for desired ESG outcomes. What can we then focus on for mineral processing plants to um, achieve a better ESG outcome. Lean design, if we uh, employ a lean design intent, we can significantly reduce the carbon footprint of our operations. Minimising construction materials such as steel and concrete, um, there's uh, carbon footprint implications in both the production and transport of those materials, so the less we employ in the construction process, the better. Then we consider the process flow sheet, minimising consumable use overall. How can we most efficiently use energy, water, reagents, and general consumables? Next, we need to consider minimisation of emissions to our surrounding environment, including noise, dust, light, and effluent streams. And in the study phase, we need to position ourselves for uh, the eventual project delivery phase and identify ethically sourced equipment. So careful consideration of our supply chain, our logistics, and use of local labour and supply components where possible. What impact can lean design have? Um, Senko has looked at some metrics on this, on what improvement can be achieved. Focusing on reducing our carbon footprint, energy and water consumption, employing um, appropriate process flow sheet equipment and technologies, reducing our bulk materials and minimising environmental impact. If we look at some of those improvements, footprint can represent a 25 to 50%. So we can get a 25 to 50% reduction in footprint with a lean design intent. Considering um, the project execution, Methodology, we can reduce project execution timeframe by 15 to 25%. Considered use of steel and concrete, uh, we can see very significant savings in quantities there, uh, as well as energy uh, usage for the same installed capacity, we can reduce that by 15 to 25%. 
and that, and that translates to a higher overall uh, processing capacity per um, for the same installed equipment. Here's some examples of footprint reduction, essentially getting the same output for less input of raw materials in the construction and design. How do we achieve this? Partly we consider the local topography. How can we leverage off the topography to reduce the amount of concrete and steel required? The second is if we're building a structure, let's minimise the amount of structure we need to put up and have some careful consideration about key process flow routes uh, whether we can leverage off the existing structure to support other pieces of uh, key mechanical equipment. The example on the left is from a South American project. The light grey shows um, the footprint from a previous phase of work that didn't consider the lean design attempt. The example on the right shows uh, an example from a project, the bottom layer it was completed by um, another engineering company and shows quite a spread out layout. The layout at the top achieves the same uh, throughput capacity. Um, it, there was careful consideration given to the operability and maintainability. When using a compact footprint, it's important to ensure that operability, maintainability and worker safety, which is one of our ESG, um, pillars also isn't compromised. And this is a graphical representation of a lean design philosophy compared to the typical industry design that's been employed to date. The blue bars show concrete, cubic metres of concrete installed per kilowatt of power. Uh, the purple bars are for steel, uh, steel tonnes per kilowatt installed. So the lean design approach we're seeing here in these examples is achieving approximately 50% um, less steel and an and a even larger um, reduction in concrete use. In recent years, Senko uh, delivered a copper concentrator project in South Australia and there's some interesting savings, and this is a great ESG example. So some smart systems, including advanced process control, allowed for individual equipment and areas of the plant to be turned off when not required. So this allowed for a significant saving in power consumption in the operation of the plant. Um, this compact and small footprint design, on including the advanced process control system, ultimately result resulted in 30% less power consumption. And if we have a look at the reduction in steel and concrete capacity, it's quite significant. And then you look at the energy of production and the associated CO2, that's quite significant um, differences there, in the savings that were achieved on that project. Then in the study phase, we need to look forward to what efficient operations may look like. So how do we use advanced process technologies? There's obviously cutting edge technologies that can improve our efficiency in our operations. We can consider de-bottlenecking, essentially, how can we get more out of our existing infrastructure and ultimately maximise recovery and product quality. Minimisation of legacy issues is really important and careful consideration of tailings technology is a key part of that. And ultimately, during this design phase in, in study and rolling into the detailed design and delivery, safety and design is a key consideration as well. We want to ensure zero harm to people and the environment. What benefit can enhanced process technologies achieve? Enhanced process technologies are a collection of emerging technologies that we can apply to plant design. Uh, what do they aim to do? Some examples, they can increase a plant head grade due to improved water waste discrimination. They target energy consumption savings in grinding circuits, improve water consumption and potentially also improve tailings environmental legacies. 
significant MPV and CapEx reductions are also achieved as well as the ESG benefit. So here's an example of a flotation concentrator. A typical process pathway may be uh, crushed ore, grinding, flotation, thickening and tailings. Fairly standard. How can enhanced process technologies uh, improve the throughput or the outcomes for a similar footprint, uh, similar equipment selected for a similar throughput? Firstly, bulk sorting. Bulk sorting can reject waste and ultimately increase the tonnage of ore being treated throughout the facility. Uh, using coarse particle flotation. Uh, essentially, you, that allows us to treat more tonnes of ore through our grinding circuit um, at a coarser grind size. There's also potential benefits with the ability to reject a coarse sand fraction which can be separately stored in tailings. Uh, these enhanced process technology pathways will be discussed further in Asenko's second webinar. An area that's often forgotten in studies and design phases is a focus on what does the end of a project life look like. So engineers often focus on considerations for the commissioning, but it's equally as important to consider decommissioning and what strategies and planning should be put in place in the study and the design phase. I'll now hand over to John Cope, who will be discussing designing for sustainability, finding a better way to create a sustainable future. Uh, thanks, Ben. Uh, that was uh, very uh, good. So. So Ben has talked about a lot of the focus points that uh, we tend to focus on in order to improve uh, sustainable outcomes. Uh, I guess my focus today will be uh, the design to design for sustainability. Uh, I guess you could say that's, uh, well, how, how do we get there? So I guess one of the key important points is that uh, for any sustainable development, then we really need good governance. Uh, governance is the foundation necessary to support the uh, sustainable, sustainable development. Uh, without it, uh, the whole structure falls down. So next slide. Ben, are you in control? Oh, thanks. Uh, okay, so we move on to uh, well, what is design uh, for su sustainability? And I guess the way I think of it, it's about establishing a game plan. And so as any good coach will tell you that if you have the right plan and, and the right team and the team follows the plan, then you'll get the results. So sustainability uh, for design, design for sustainability is really about integrating uh, sustainable development principles into the decision making during the design phase of the project. So it's to encourage innovation and cost savings while also improving the environmental and social performance, or as I like to think of it, maintaining the balance and just not having an economic focus. So what should be considered in DFS? Well, when you look at uh, the, some of the elements in uh, sustainable uh, development, it's, um, there is literally uh, many, many elements. Uh, it uh, can be very confusing and very uh, overwhelming at times. Um, and uh, these are just some of the aspects of sustainable development. Uh, when you look at uh, the uh, under each, each pillar and um, as we move forward, this uh, list just keeps on growing. So at the end of the day, sustainable development is not a simple thing to achieve. In fact, it's uh, often been called a wicked problem uh, in the sense that it's uh, a very complex, complex area. So just moving next slide, Ben. So why use DFS? Well, ultimately the goal of uh, design for sustainability is to achieve better decision making. And in order to do that, we can improve the uh, ESG profile through better design, engineering, implementation, and enhance the ESG performances while meeting the economic targets. The key, one of the key things here is the economics. Okay, it's uh, often uh, sometimes not thought of in uh, sustainability terms, but it is a key pillar, and so we really need to ensure that uh, economic uh, targets are met. Uh, whilst uh, still enhancing the other two pillars. 
It builds on existing skills and capabilities. Uh, I guess um, as engineers and uh, practitioners, process engineers and uh, so forth, we're really the ones that uh, in the, in the, during the design phase that has these skills, whether we know it or not, to improve those sustainability outcomes because we're often the best place at identifying what is possible and what is not possible and the consequences and benefits of, uh, of those uh, options. As we know, the ability to influence the outcomes of a project is the highest in the earlier stages. So it's critical that we apply these things in the earliest possible time. So that's uh, in the concept development uh, phase, uh, but equally, as we progress through the uh, design phases from say concept to, feasib to feasibility and onto detailed design, there are many more decisions made say during the design phase. So they're just as important. Whilst they're not as big a decisions, the sheer number of them means that if we can apply sustainability principles to those decisions, then many, many small gains made along the way will add up to big overall gains. Using a more holistic approach ensures that better decisions are made and we don't just consider the financial and technical outcomes. I guess I look at it uh, by making decisions through the sustainability lens. So you're putting a little bit of a different look on a problem. Okay, so some of the drivers um, of moving forward, um, uh, it provides confidence that sustainable development outcomes have been maximised. So I guess uh, the, the um, thing is, is the fear of the unknown. Uh, whilst you might have made some good gains, there's always a, um, uh, a case of, well, what did we miss? Okay, so by having a good uh, established uh, process ensures that uh, we maximise those opportunities through the design phase. Provides data for benchmarking and feedback to stakeholders. This is very important because often, unless we have mechanisms in place at the start of the project, then we don't, we aren't able to capture that data that can substantiate and compare those um, uh, gains. Approvals and investment funding, as we know that um, uh, the uh, industry is moving uh, to a more sustainable funding model. Uh, many. Uh, Fund managers such as super funds uh, now carry linkages to sustainability goals and so that can actually lead to a, re a reduction in the cost of the capital. Professional ethics, uh, in, uh, important uh, point because um, as we are members of uh, technical societies as being professionals and um, uh, professional ethics from many of these uh, institutions uh, such as IOST uh, requires us to promote sustainability as one of their core code of, uh, code of ethics uh, domains. Moving on. Okay, what framework standards and tools are available? Well, I guess um, when we come to sustainability, it's a bit like comparing apples, oranges and pears. I mean, how do you, how do we equate social equity against say um, environmental? So if we, we have a solution or an option that might uh, achieve some uh, environmental gains, but at the cost of some social uh, negative impacts in, in the social domain, how do we equate the two? So it's a bit like the uh, apples, orange, some pears issue. I guess there are many, many frameworks, um, a plethora of frameworks and guidelines and standards, which uh, I guess uh, aim to help us in this field. I mean, these are just a select few. Um, I guess for the average engineer working on a project, this creates a problem in itself in the sense of which one do I use? It can be overwhelming. But I guess the key point is that um, you align those tools and frameworks to the objectives of your project and the objectives of your organisation and clients needs and all your stakeholders, both internal and external. And that's the uh, community as well. Moving on, Daniel. So what does the process look like? Uh, well, that's a difficult question to answer because it's, uh, there's actually a uh, lack of uh, a standard in, uh, industry-wide procedures on how we actually, uh, what DFS looks like. Um, but I guess at the end of the day, we need to bridge the gap between the theory and the practice. So we need to take some of those uh, organisational 
uh, and uh, aspirational type um, theoretical sustainability practices and put and actually put them into practice. So the process would probably look like uh, something like uh, you start off with the goal setting. We need to identify the opportunities and the risks. We need to make an assessment of those and prioritise those so as to know which is the best ones to get to look at. We need to uh, then implement them and monitor their performance because sometimes their performance is different to what we think at the start will be. And so as we compare them to the goals. So um, some of the key elements is that it's got to be integrated and consistent with the project operational wide framework. So it's got to be consistent and it's got to be able to be integrated. We need to uh, initial definition of the problem in sustainability terms. Generation of uh, assessment, generation and assessment of alternatives, involvement of stakeholders and life cycle thinking. It's very, life cycle thinking is important because many decisions that are made in the design phase will have ongoing impacts through the procurement, construction and operational and eventually close out phases. The key, one of the key, the key elements is that we must be able to integrate these sustainability principles into existing project management systems. Okay, just moving on. So what's needed to make DFS work? DF, well, as uh, Ben Gerda and Kwok um, uh, determined that uh, the uh, DFS success comes when the principles are well documented and explained. All stakeholders agree on what sustainability means and that sustainable plant design is treated as a core process. So it's got to be well documented and integrated into your normal day-to-day -day systems. The second thing, and it's really about the team, and it's about the mindset of the team. As engineers, we're often conditioned around a compliance type of thinking in the sense that we uh, comply with regulations and codes and standards. And so historically, we've adopted a compliance approach to sustainability. This can itself be limited and constrain the outcomes. And it is better to, uh, better outcomes occur when innovative thinking is applied as innovative thinking is unconstrained. Systems thinking. Uh, is about uh, breaking the problem down into components to establish the linkages that exist in interactions. As we can see by one of the earlier slides, there's many elements. And so it's sometimes very complex to, uh, to determine uh, the cause and effect between different elements. So for example, you might have a positive impact on an environmental aspect, which may actually lead to a negative uh, social impact. So often a change in one element can cause unexpected effects in other elements. Value approach. So thinking of value in not just economic value, but in also in social and environmental value. Training and expertise. Um, I guess because the sustainability uh, area is such a broad and over all encompassing area, it's very important that um, uh, you have uh, trained your staff and have some expertise in sustainability principles. And that, uh, I guess, can lead to uh, the alignment of your corporate and personal values. So you need to be on the same page and basically all moving in the same direction. Okay, well, that uh, completes uh, my uh, presentation on uh, design for sustainability. I'll now hand over to, uh, to Daniel, who will talk about some of the social factors in project delivery. Thanks, John. Uh, as John mentioned, uh, I'm excited for the opportunity to discuss social factors in project delivery. Uh, my focus today will be on the social and community engagement, both at a community level and at the local economy level, supporting both the supply chain and the contractors. Uh, for me, I'm interested in this area. I actually grew up in central Queensland, so got to see the firsthand the, the influence that companies have on the local communities. Um, part of it I'll also build on some of the ESG drivers identified by Ben and John as part of our responsible planning and lean design. And typically it will vary project to project depending on uh, the specifics of each project. We we'll usually partner with our client and the business partners to best engage the local communities. Um, 
Today, primarily, I'm going to focus on our Ravenswood Gold expansion project, which is a current project we have in execution as a case study. Uh, however, I'll also give a little bit of insight into some of our process and examples in both past and present projects. So, uh, a future project that we're working on, Eva Copper, which is in Concurry, and Carapatina, which was in South Australia. Uh, Ravenswood, I'll focus primarily on some of the background of the project just to give everyone a little bit of line of sight. Uh, also, look at our Books and Homes initiative which we're extremely proud of as part of the business um, and both our local content in terms of supply and procurement and engagement of our contractors. Um, so for Ravenswood, it's a current project we have. Um, it's hit execution uh, mid last year and it's due for completion in quarter one next, uh, next year. Um, Ozenko are currently providing the EPCM services for the process plan and that was following some due diligence and early works completed in the middle of last year. Um, the project is a Brandfields expansion project which is progressing well. Um, currently engineering is complete and we're now in uh, terms of we've handed over stage one which took place in August and we're now focusing in on stage two crushing circuit. Post completion of both stage two and three, Ravenswood will actually be the, the largest gold mine in, in Queensland, producing approximately 200,000 ounces of gold per annum. Um, one of the key areas I'll focus on at an engineering level is probably separate to um, the community engagement, was probably one of the key solutions which came out of the project. Uh, that was one in which the engineering design layout was focused on in terms of uh, reducing our overall footprint. Print. Part of that, we engaged uh, noise consultants to review the overall ROM pad and primary crusher location uh, in relation to the local township. So anyone who's been up to Ravenswood would understand actually how close the operation is to the local township. Uh, following review, the location and the direction of the pad and crusher were actually relocated and redesigned to reduce the noise impacts to the local community and the local noise receptors. Um, next slide, Ben. Uh, books and Homes. So look, Ozenko Foundation is a charitable foundation established back in 2011 by Ozenko. Uh, it was actually, the intent of it is to be involved in a number of community-based charitable initiatives around the world, not only in Australia, where we, where we have either an office or a project which is in delivery. Uh, it utilises our expertise and resources to help improve the health and safety of the communities in which we live and work. The focus of the foundation is actually on providing a hand up, not a handout. So the intent there is around leaving a lasting legacy as part of our engagement. A uh, key aim of the foundation is actually to involve the, uh, sorry, improve the opportunities and outcomes of, for children in disadvantaged communities on the basis in that we recognise that the children do not have any choice in the situation in which they are born. On the basis of that, one of the initiatives that we support is the Books and Homes Australia. In 2014, the Ozenko Foundation began this partnership and was primarily uh, there to run the program at a primary school level. As part of the Ravenswood project, we partnered with uh, Books and Homes with, and the local schools at Ravenswood and Townsville South, and to date we've delivered over 400 books to the children in these schools. Not only do we support the local projects, we continue to support Durack State School, which is in Brisbane. But over the years, we've also supported Port Augusta with uh, Oz Minerals on Carapatina, Mackay, which is uh, associated with our Cap Copper operations, and Don Allard Primary School, which is in Perth, um, which is associated with our Perth office. Next slide, Ben. Uh, local engagement. So before I talk about specifics uh, related to Ravenswood, I, I just want to give a little bit of background in terms of how we uh, front end load and plan the, the execution phase. Um, as I said, key, key focus during that early phase is really our supplier and contractor identification and part of our ECI process. Uh, currently we're in that process for EVA Copper Project, so we're engaging with all the local contractors and local community at the moment. Um, 
part of our focus is our contracting strategy and engaging with the local suppliers and best help to best refine the delivery model based on each of their capabilities. Um, during this identification phase, some of the areas we'll look at are uh, capability and experience, current workload, the constraints on the location. So probably one of the best examples that exist in the current market is COVID and the current impacts that we're seeing in terms of uh, both in Australia and each of the individual states at the moment. Um, the other one which we're seeing currently is the impacted supply market around freight and logistics and, and areas of that nature. Um, so we really focus in on how best to mitigate any potential impacts to the project or delays. Um, in addition to this, we focus in on the workforce supply, so what we call local versus non-local as part of our key consideration. Um, and this then forms part of the evaluations with each of the contractors and suppliers. Um, and it's of particular importance at the moment based on the impacted labour market and the resources available in the industry at the moment. We then utilise this uh, feedback to best, best overall improve our, our strategy moving forward into the execution. One of the other big areas which we focus on is actually uh, our engagement with First Nations and our uh, community engagement. Ozenko has actually partnered with uh, what we call RES or Regional Economic Solutions to support our engagement with the First Nations communities and the traditional owners. Uh, as part of the Karapatina project, RES partnered with Ozenko, Downer JV and the traditional owners to help de-risk the project approvals identify First Nation business owners and support an 11% community employment on the project. Uh, next slide, Ben. So taking some of that into consideration in terms of our front end planning with respect to suppliers and contractors, we've been able to achieve some of the following on Ravenswood. Uh, Ravenswood project has total supply and procurement worth approximately 83 million of which 40% has been purchased locally within Queensland and 53% purchased within Australia. Um, some of the key packages includes concrete supply. So um, we've actually been able to source a concrete from a local company called Towers Concrete. They're based out of Charters Towers. Uh, by end of project, we would have supplied close to 12,000 cubes of concrete for the project and close to three and a half million dollars worth for Towers Concrete. Um, another big area in terms of local engagement was our steel supply, which was broken up into two primary packages for the project, both the fabricated steel and plate steel supply. Uh, fabricated steel was supplied by a company called Thomas Steel out of Townsville and Cairns. Uh, they supplied uh, 1,600 tonne of fabricated steel at approximate value of about $14 million. In addition to that, we've engaged Dawson's Engineering and Mineforce, both based out North Queensland, for the platework supply valued at close to $10 million. Next slide, please, Ben. Uh, local contract engagement. So currently we have uh, actually six major contractors on site performing works associated with the process plant. Four of those are local contractors, Wargaroo, RMS, Minelec and Mineforce. They're all based out of Townsville. Our other two contractors are Brisbane-based Sun Engineering and Western Down Civil. Uh, these contracts have a total value of close to $90 million. Um, as I mentioned previously, a key area of our assessment and our engagement relates to overall workforce and seeking to source as many locals as possible from within the, both the Townsville and Charters Towers regions to support the project. Currently, we're sitting at approximately 40% locals, oh sorry, 50% employed within the um, Townsville region, and then the remainder being sourced from both Brisbane and the North Queensland regions. One of the major challenges, as I highlighted before, has been our impacts of COVID and our ability to source labour within the region. Uh, as you can understand, the, the pool of labour is, is limited based on the inability to travel interstate and historically the construction work, workforce is transient in nature. Uh, therefore, with the limited pool of labour, we're actually competing with other major projects, both within Queensland and North Queensland regions. A key area for Ozenko with the project team has been the foster engagement uh, between the contractors, the client and Ozenko. 
Uh, the photo you see here actually demonstrates a facilitated workshop with each of the senior reps from uh, both the contractors, client and ourselves. Key outcome of the workshop was what we call our project charter. Um, this was actually produced by mapping each of the company's core values and the related behaviours of the teams. This has enabled us to share, have a shared set of values for the project and the community environment is one of those identified during the workshop, as you can see in the lower uh, right corner there. So, um, I think that pretty much wraps up my section, but on behalf of uh, Ben, John and myself, just wanted to thank you for your time today discussing embedding ESG and mining projects from concept to operations. I'd also like to acknowledge the partnership with OzIMM and encourage you to join us for the next two webinars, uh, ESG Cutting Edge Technologies and the Future of Mining and ESG. Uh, I will now open it up to Q&A if anyone would like to send through any questions. Um, so Ben, probably one for you here. Uh, lean design as a concept sounds wonderful and logical. But are there any concerns that reduced concrete and steel may result in any long-term structural issues to get in the plants that exceed their design life? Thanks, Dan. Yeah, we certainly don't compromise on the uh, engineering integrity or structural integrity. Um, you know, make sure that there is sufficient structural um, support for our process plants. It's more you know, if you put, as I discussed before, if you're putting up a, st a structure, let's support as much as we can from it, rather than building multiple structures, which inherently require more, more concrete and more steel for, for disc discrete structures. Uh, so, question here, probably for of us, uh, and might ask Rolf if you could maybe clarify. But uh, he said, when engineers are spoken of, does that include social performance specialists, and what are they? What do they bring to the table? Uh, John or Ben, I don't know if you've got anything there. Um, Rolf, I don't know if you'd like to clarify that maybe a little bit more. Um, I guess uh, just uh, answering that, I mean, uh, one of the key uh, key points uh, was having uh, the necessary skills in sustainability, and that's important. And uh, having a team to be trained in those sustainability principles. So. So those sorts of social uh, practitioners um, add value to the uh, to the team, particularly in the design process. And uh, but I guess you need to consider it as a team approach. Nobody's an expert at everything, so it's about uh, building the collective knowledge for your team uh, and balancing that through through those uh, with the use of those uh, those tools in order to get the outcomes. I'm not sure if that answers the question. Uh, so, further one here, common understanding of sustainable development. Often there is a gap achieving a common understanding from early exploration stage onwards. Populist views are frequent any development. Uh, what useful early steps need to be taken by developers to bridge the gap? I think this goes back to what we were discussing in uh, early phases of studies is it's really actively listening to all the stakeholders um, and understanding what their concerns and their key drivers are and building an ESG framework around that. Um, you know, ESG certainly isn't a barrier to development. It's actually a tool that provides us with the social license and, and the best framework to deliver our projects and engage with our communities. All right. uh, probably one, John, for you. What do you think are the critical competencies for embedding ESG into designing and developing projects and during operation? Um, sorry, you're just breaking up there a little bit, uh, Daniel, but uh, I think I've got a question. I'll repeat it if you like, mate. Uh, so, what do you think are the critical competencies for embedding ESG into design and developing projects and during operations? Uh, critical competency is that, as, as I see it, um, is is really you've got to have probably uh, two main things. Okay, you've got to have the, the right people uh, with the right mindsets and the right tools and training. Um, you've got to have the systems and processes. 
So when you combine those those two two things together, I think that's when you do get the uh, the good outcomes. Seeing if there's any further questions. Um, what differences in ESG priorities are there between corporate head offices and on the ground staff? So I think from my perspective, Steve, um, I think at the moment for, for me, what I've seen in terms of the site-based teams, it is an education. Um, historically, uh, I'll say it's a bit like HSC, maybe 30 or 40 years ago, we are going through a bit of an education phase. Um, probably to John's point around the different, uh, it, it is probably unclear in terms of the different requirements. So for us, it's really setting a set of requirements within the business and then starting to then flow those through to the different groups, both at a site level and during a design phase as well. Uh, next one, how do we support local businesses not directly engaged during construction? Uh, projects when local recruitment competes with limit, for limited skilled locals and drives up wages, accommodation, it, it costs, etc. for a brief time. Uh, look, good question. Obviously, for us, it is a natural co competition with, um, I'll, I'll give you an example of the smaller communities. For us, it's actually trying to be best how do we support the supply chain, both from a local's perspective um, and how do we inject as much economy as we can, both from suppliers and or uh, workforce. So for us, during those early phases, we will engage with the local community and local councils about how best do we actually integrate the, the local community and engage as many people as possible through that phase. Um, Next one, so can you suggest some KPIs for demonstrating achievement in ESG delivery? John or Ben, I don't know if you wanted to jump in. Um, this is a very uh, difficult, um, difficult question because there are literally hundreds of potential KPIs. And so if you look at the various frameworks, uh, even going back to the um, GRI type framework, uh, there are many, many KPIs. Um, I guess it's about choosing which ones are the most relevant to your project and uh, is, uh, comes back to the alignment with the um, sustainability goals of your project and organisation. And I guess uh, uh, choosing those uh, indicators uh, that best align with that. Just to add to John's point, uh... It, it's, this is a topic that's fairly widely discussed and the fact that there's not a consistent framework and one of the key messages for industry is pick some KPIs and measure yourselves against them and discuss them openly with your stakeholders, your communities, your shareholders. Um, you know, certainly you should be active in the ESG space. Whichever framework you choose, it will, they will evolve over time and the metrics will change. But picking a starting point, measuring yourself against it and being transparent with that process is important. Correct. And I guess just to add to uh, add to that, Ben, um, it's also important to pick the right KPIs that gives you a balanced uh, view of your overall sustainability achievements. Often there's, um, there's a, uh, I guess, a tendency to pick those KPIs that are easy to measure, uh, but at the end of the day, they might not give you a true indication. So it's really important to pick the right KPIs that really are going to give you the best indication of your performance. All right. um, one I'm happy to uh, respond to is the next one. So how do you treat tailings at Ravenswood? Is there a TSF or dry disposal mechanical dewatering? Um, so look, for us, it's actually outside of our scope within the EPCM services for Zinco. I'm happy to give the answer. Uh, so they actually treat my TSF on site at Ravenswood. So they're currently building a new tailing storage facility as part of the overall expansion for the project. No further questions at the moment. Sorry, did the audio cut out? So um, I'll say that again. So how do we treat tailings at Ravenswood? 
is there a TSF or dry disposal or mechanical dewatering? So currently there's a um, existing TSF and that's being expanded as part of the project. Um, so one for myself, uh, what percentage or value of Indigenous engagement is being targeted for the EVA Copper project? Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, Carapatina, we achieved 11%. Our target is actually uh, between 12 to 15% for EVA Copper. Um, for us, it's not only the construction phase, sustainability of employment actually extends beyond that. Uh, so I, for us, it's actually working through with the client in terms of uh, moving those individuals into operations longer term, and then that includes actually uh, apprentices as well. So, uh, so myself, so has there been any consideration given to providing or conserving and promoting pre-existing mining heritage as part of the need to engage the local community, particularly with the current and previous mine employees. Um, so look, for myself, I suppose at a, at a Nozenko level, we haven't done a substantial amount of engagement with respect to that for Ravenswood. However, the client and the owner uh, of the mine has done substantial in terms of uh, maintaining and preserving the local heritage within the area. Um, there was actually three stacks that they moved as part of that, which we were in the mining area. So they've relocated that and rebuilt those stacks as part of the overall mining heritage within the area. Uh, so there's been a substantial amount of engagement with the local community to ensure that they maintain that as part of the mine's expansion. Uh, probably Ben, one for you. What do you think sustainability and design will look like in the future? Uh, I might just answer that one if I could, uh, Ben, if that's okay. Yeah, go for it, John. Um, good question. Uh, I think the best way to sort of look at sometimes predicting the future is to look back at the past. And the way I see sustainability and design going is probably somewhat similar to the way safety and design has progressed perhaps over the last, I don't know, 50 years or so. Um, I guess uh, from the early days when I started in the industry, it, it wasn't a big focus, uh, but that has uh, certainly uh, changed today. And um, I guess one example of that was, uh, I was just uh, looking at a uh, LinkedIn post from a colleague of mine on his very first project, a guy I went to uni with, um, and um, just the uh, PPE that he was wearing uh, was um, substantially different to what you would see today. I mean, he had shorts, shorts on, short sleeve shirt. Uh, I think he might have had a hard hat, no glasses, probably no steel cap boots, etc. And that was only uh, about uh, 30 or less than 30 years ago. You apply that to today, uh, and that would be a totally different picture. And I think a lot of that has been around uh, building that safety culture and that safety and design culture in the in the, in the, in the engineering phase. And so I can sort of see that sustainable sustainability and design will will follow a similar path. But uh, and I think we can leverage off uh, a lot of the learnings uh, in in that process. And so ultimately, what I'd like to see is that sustainability and design is um, as much a part of our design process as to what safety and design is today. Uh, one final question by look, so uh, probably for Ben, when conducting studies, what ESG considerations are given to the life cycle of the product generated at a mine? Yeah, that's a good question. It's really important to consider the entire uh, value chain and the ESG implications along that value chain. So one example would be, you know, it's very important for us when we're looking at the the flow sheet on a site before you you sell a final product to you know it's to make sure that we're reducing impurities and things that may report downstream and have um, a, a legacy issue uh, at a different stage of the the uh, value chain. Um, another quite interesting element of this is I liken it to the food industry where people are increasingly interested in the pedigree of where their food comes from and that's certainly becoming a trend uh, for our minerals products and blockchain technology is forming a large part of that. So there's a big push for um, green, whether it's green nickel or other other metals that 
you can show that they've come from a site where there's strong ESG considerations, renewable power, etc. Um, so technology will play a, a large part, and I think for us, it's really understanding that value chain and, and considering the entire value chain and not just our scope. Okay. Um, so we have no further questions. So Kelvin, I'll happily uh, pass to you if you like to wrap it up. Sure. Thank you, Daniel. Much appreciated. And also thank you to uh, Ben and John as well for your presentations. Um, I would just yeah like to thank everyone for asking questions and joining us today. And a big thank you to Ben, John and Daniel on behalf of the OzIMM for taking the time and energy to present today.